Well, my favorite design on crockery is fruit. And when they get this up, you're going to see um, some crockery with fruit on it. And uh, there's something in me that's just like a radar if I'm at the shops, and I will always look and see if I can find something with fruit on it. Well, last year, I was in London and leading a a leadership workshop at the Arise Conference and had really, we'd worked hard for a week. This was just with our executive team. And at the end, on the last day, we went to a traditional English tea house. And inside was a, a old tea set with teapot and a milk jug and cream jug. And would you believe it? The whole set was covered in fruit. And after a a hard week at work, it was just like God had given me this big wink. (laughs) And he just said, I see the hard work. And he was just promising that this was going to be very fruitful. And it's amazing. Since uh, that time, there's been huge changes. We we re-strategized, restructured the whole of Arise. And there has been such growth and such fruitfulness from the time that was put in. We should expect fruitfulness in our lives. And John brought a word last Sunday, uh, the first of our Knowing Jesus series. From Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine, we learned that there is no problem too big for Jesus. There is no problem too small for Jesus. And Jesus is not into laying blame. Great word. Well, each message this term is going to reveal more of Jesus' heart and character for us to know and to love. And it is not uh, head knowledge, but it's heart knowledge that we are after. Heart knowledge that will increase our experience of and our intimacy with Jesus. Because Jesus is not dead on a cross. Jesus is not still in a tomb. He is not glued onto the pages of a children's story Bible, and he is not limited to our past experiences, and nor is he shocked or repulsed by sin. He alone is the solution to our sin problem. Next slide, and then the one after. He is alive, and he is real, and he is here right now in the midst of us, because the word tells us that where two or three are gathered, there he is with us also. So you can, if there's an empty seat, you can say, thanks for coming, Jesus. Thanks for coming. He is the most loving and the most joyful and the most gracious and the most powerful, all-embracing friend of sinners, brother, teacher, healer, Lord, King, and the Son of God. And he wants with us an active, alive, fruitful relationship with him today. Today we're going to examine the last of Jesus' I am statements from the book of John. I thought we'll just go straight to the end. His last I am statement. And it's where Jesus wanted his disciples to know then how to know him intimately and how to continue on in relationship with him. And so he spoke very plainly and he used word pictures that just ordinary everyday people would get. So our Bible reading now is from John 15 verses 1 to 8. It will be on the screen. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet, 
and had just celebrated the Last Supper. And he and the disciples were on their way walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus would pray on the night before his crucifixion. Jesus is actually preparing his disciples for his departure after three years of close relationship. You can imagine his disciples are distressed and they are uncertain about a future without Jesus physically present with them to lead them. And so Jesus promises in John 15, John 13 is where they wash the feet, celebrate the Last Supper. John 14, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. And if you jump over John 15 to John 16, there Jesus describes how the Holy Spirit works. So we've got the promise of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit, and smack bang in the middle in John 15, we have Jesus teaching them how they can stay closely connected to Jesus, how to be effective, how to be fruitful, how to remain intimately connected and to continue submitting to the work of his word and his Holy Spirit. John 15 verses 1 to 8 teaches us today. And God is speaking to us through his word here this morning, how we can be in close relationship with Jesus and how we can grow and how we can be his followers and how we can lead incredibly fruitful lives. Still today, Israel is a land of vineyards. The central hill country is terraced and it is still covered in fruitful vines. And it's so important for us to understand the significance of vines and vineyards in Middle Eastern biblical culture. Jesus was using a very familiar and a very essential part of daily life for the Old Testament Israelites and also for these New Testament disciples. Grapes were a staple source of fruit. They would eat the fruit of the vine. Then they would mash that fruit up and they would boil it until it was a syrup called grape honey, or they called it dibs. And they would dip their bread in this grape syrup. They would also crush the fruit and they would produce wine. And they would drink wine like we drink water. It was actually a watered-down wine because the water was actually not very hygienic to drink, but by adding wine, it was like uh, it purified the water. So that's why even the little kids were drinking the wine. And then they would dry the fruit and make raisins. Did you know that they picked the best fruit to make raisins? I thought you'd use the lousy fruit to create shriveled-up raisins. But they would take the best of the fruit and they would um, sprinkle olive oil as the raisins dried so that the outside skin remained moist. Grapevines studded the hillsides of Palestine and most homes, if you lived in your own home, you'd have a grapevine growing over the top of your roof. Israel, God's chosen people, frequently throughout the Old Testament are called a vine. Psalm 80 verse 8, you transplanted a vine from out of Egypt you drove out the nations and you planted it and you cleared the ground for it and it took root and it filled the land. God's blessing was often marked by having your own vine and your own fig tree. 1 Kings 4 verse 25, during Solomon's lifetime, Solomon of course, a very wealthy king, Judah and Israel lived in safety and everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Such a picture of security and peace. Those blessed by God didn't even have to go far to eat <laughs> of the riches that he provided for them. And even God's, uh, the plagues that God sent to Egypt, one of those plagues, and whenever a, a nation or a city was destroyed, it always included the devastation of their vineyards. Take away their food supply. Take away their wealth. Psalm 78, 47, he destroyed their vineyards with hail and their sycamore trees with sleet. Vineyards represented God's provision, represented God's prosperity, and represented the well-being of God's people. But here now, in John 15, Jesus distinguishes himself as the true vine 
from Israel, who was just the vine. You see, Jesus came to fulfill what Israel could never do and had failed to do. Israel, the nation of God's people, repeatedly sinned, repeatedly worshipped the idols of their neighbours, repeatedly rejected God. Jesus alone was the sinless Son of God. He alone fulfilled the law and the prophets. He alone is the true vine from which all life comes. Jesus alone carved the path of forgiveness through his death on the cross so that all men could come to him, so that he would make a way back to having relationship with the Father and so that we could belong to God's family. Jesus alone is the true vine and all other things are false. Jesus alone is the source of abundant and eternal life. And like the Israelites tried to draw life from idols of wood and stone, we sometimes try to draw life and purpose and meaning from possessions, from position, from professions and our possessions. Those are today's idols. But they fail to bear fruit and they fail to give us purpose-filled, satisfying lives because Jesus alone connects us to the Father. Jesus alone is the source of life and purpose. Jesus alone is the true vine. Don't bother connecting your life to anything else because there will be no fruit from it. There will be no life from it. Perhaps we accepted Jesus when we were first saved and we received the forgiveness for our sins and and we made a new beginning. Hooray! But my question this morning is, have we remained intimately connected to Jesus as the continuing vine in our life, the continuing source of everything we need? Do we know Jesus better now than we knew him then? Have we started tapping into things, modern day idols, as a source of life and fulfilment? I personally have been challenged last year and this year not to take Jesus for granted, but to pursue knowing him intimately, to just talk to him personally. Like I said to you, talk to the empty chair next to you, say thanks for coming. (laughs) To talk to him intimately, pursue knowing him, enjoy worshipping him. Crank on as music, uh, worship music that's very Jesus-focused and dance around my house till I get happy. And he's there with me, dancing with me, having a good time, having a good party with me. You see, it's possible to become so over-familiar with the Jesus of the Bible and maybe the Jesus of the stories that we don't draw the life and the power that only comes from him, that we even distance ourselves somewhat or tap into a few other things to fulfill us and make us feel happy. Do you know it's possible to do this in our marriages and in our relationships? It's possible to take one another for granted, assuming they'll always be there, not investing in that person personally. But we tend to reap what we sow. If we do not sow into our relationships, then we will settle for the ordinary. Ah, the mowing will get done, the house will get cleaned, and the dinners will get cooked but there'll be little joy and little positive influence on others. Unbelievers should look at our relationships, our marriages, our friendships, and want them, want what we have. Are we going through the motions of a relationship with Jesus? Maybe we're reading our Bible and we are serving on teams and we are singing worship songs in church, but not feeling connected not enjoying the journey, not excited about the future. Do others look at our Christian life and want what we've got? When we remain in Jesus and he remains in us, we will enjoy the relationship and we will grow. We will grow increasingly in every area of our lives. It just has to happen. It's not an if, but, or maybe Jesus alone is the source of the Spirit. 
I think sometimes, you know, we say, oh, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. We kind of do a direct to the Holy Spirit deal. Who sends the Holy Spirit? Who is the source of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit says nothing apart from what Jesus says. Jesus is the vine and he's the source of the Spirit of God. Jesus alone makes our lives fruitful, purposeful, joyful. You know, people didn't have to be told to follow Jesus. <laughs> Crowds just followed him. You know, he had to push out in a boat because people were just wanting to be around him. And children climbed into his lap. And the sinful and the sick, they came and they sought him out. Because he was fascinating. He was so unpredictable. You just never knew what he was going to do next. He was surprising. He healed people. He set people free from mental suffering. He fed the hungry and he forgave the sinners and he gave new beginnings to those who had failed and he raised the dead and he wept with those who mourned. Even in our Bible reading here in John 15, Jesus is more concerned about preparing his disciples for his absence than about his own suffering and imminent death. Look, if it was the night before I'm about to die, I think I might be somewhat more selfish. This, this is the same Jesus who did all of those things, who was calling us to continue following him, to be the true vine that we commit our entire hearts to. I want to give you two signs that show we're connected to Jesus. And I trust this is going to be encouraging for you. John 15 verses 1 to 8 may sometimes seem a little bit scary. Words like cut off, <laughs> take away, um, wither, <laughs> thrown into the fire, <laughs> burned. <laughs> Those sort of phrases are a little bit daunting. And so maybe we just sort of skim, we skim over the scary bits. But in doing so, we may miss the nurturing, loving, life-giving Jesus who is here. Verse 2 begins, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, our version said, takes away. Many other versions say, um, sorry, our version said cuts off, but other versions say take away. The term take away is actually translated from the Greek word ahero. Everyone say ahero. All right. Now, that word can mean take away, but it can equally be interpreted to say lifts up. A hero can mean take away, but it can also mean lift up. And in fact, famous reformed theologian James Boyce in his studies said that more frequently it is used to say lift up in the scriptures. And if you asked a vine dresser in Israel, which was the correct meaning, take away or lift up, the meaning would be very obvious to a vine dresser in Israel. Because in ancient Judean vineyards, a vine left to its own devices or ten natural tendencies would just grow into a, like a mat on the floor if no one took care of it. And given the warm days... And the cold nights in the south of Israel and the moisture-laden prevailing westerly winds that blew in from the Mediterranean, heavy morning dews would come in the mornings, in spring and in early summer. And this pre-dawn moisture that would blow in would cause the development of mold and fungus on anything that stayed in contact with the ground. There's very little similarity between Middle Eastern vineyard methods of Jesus' time and our Western viniculture practices. So this affects our reading of the scriptures here. You see Middle Eastern, and have we got a picture coming up? No, you're way too far ahead now. Go back. Go back, go back. Previous slide, please. Next one, previous to that. Aha, uh -huh, that's where we're at. 
All right. Their vines didn't have trellises. No wires, no sticks. So when the branches started to grow low and crowd in on top of each other and lay on the ground, the Middle Eastern vineyard owner would have to actually lift up the branches and they would prop stones underneath and they would put sticks against the stones and just prop up individual grapevine by individual grapevine. So it makes very good sense that this first use of the word a hero can be interpreted as lift up and not takes away. Because if we, the branch was taken away there and then, it would not have any chance of further productivity. Propping it up, lifting it up, repositioning the branch actually assists productivity. So the first sign that you are connected to the vine is that you are repositioned. And God has every right to reposition us in life to get us to produce well. It may be moving us from a position of comfort and self-assurance, moving us to a position of some uncertainty, but of greater trust in him, resulting in greater fruitfulness than we ever would have imagined. John and I grew up in the same denomination in our, into our 30s, and after being filled with the Holy Spirit, we became increasingly uncomfortable until God repositioned us in a Pentecostal church. Now, I can assure you that John was very uncomfortable when we first went to a Pentecostal church. This was, this was John at the height of worship <laughs> for some time until God worked in both of us. He discomforted us, repositioned us to the point that we became Pentecostal pastors. That certainly wasn't in our, in our plan. That would never have happened if we had not been repositioned. You see, God will reposition connected but underproducing branches so that the air of the Spirit can flow around the branches, get rid of the mold and the fungus, and cause it to be more fruitful, cause those branches. He helps them to bear fruit. So the first sign that we are connected to Jesus, that we're connected to the true vine, is that we get repositioned at times. The second sign is pruning, or the other interpretation of the word pruning is cleaning. I must admit, I like the word cleaning better. And it was a very crucial process to tending vineyards. You know that the growth and the production actually requires some deprivation. Good growth and production requires some deprivation and stress. Interesting. If left to grow unattended, the vine will just produce a whole lot of lush foliage, but little fruit. Pruning in biblical times was done with pruning hooks, which was like a little mini sickle with a sharp point and a wooden handle. And the vineyard dresser would just clean the branches away or some of the leaves away. Pruning branches actually benefits the entire plant, removing what doesn't benefit the plant and directing the energy of the plant so where it can produce most fruit. So this is a real fruit vine, uh, grapevine, sorry, and uh, it was actually a gift from Peter Hungerford, who knows about all of these things. <laughs> I know little. No. So just have a look at this one. <laughs> have a look at this one. All right, can you see there's a, there's a nice new growth there. There's nothing happening here. Well, this is still taking energy, sap, all the way to the end to keep that alive. But if we prune it back here, all the energy of the plant will go to making this one grow bigger and more fruitful. So, okay. So now the energy of the plant can go to these parts and probably... See, this one's just got a little bit of green there, so I'm not sure about this one. I probably should go to Google before I do anything else. <laughs> or ask Peter. Go to Google or ask Peter. What are the other? 
Okay, I'll shut that, keep everything safe. In John 15 verses 1 to 8, Jesus is describing the nature of Christian growth. God prunes every branch that bears no fruit so that it will be more fruitful. Far from being an image of punishment, pruning signifies the nurture and the care of God for greater growth and greater fruitfulness. Do you know, leaf pruning is actually, it's a continual process. It's not just, oh, occasionally I'll look out to see if there's a, a big one sticking out and I'll hack it off. While the um, plant is in full bloom, we on to the pruning one now? Yes, there we go. While it's in full bloom, um, they go around daily and they look at the leaves and they look where the fruit is. I would have been so cool to have a really good one, but they don't have any in fruit I could buy. Um, if the fruit's here and the leaves are covering too much of the fruit... They'll actually remove, just gently cleaning, just nipping, nipping, pulling away any of the leaves that are taking the sun, blocking the sun from that lush fruit that's growing. So pruning and cleaning is not an occasional or a one-off process. It's like this daily, regular process. I won't cut any of these leaves off because it doesn't have many yet. <laughs> yeah, it has been. Had caterpillars did have a go. All right, Jesus repositioned his disciples when he said, follow me. He lifted up some branches that were not bearing fruit. And what he did is he put them in a better environment for future fruitfulness. And he started to prune away at everything they had dogmatically held to in their right and true Jewish religious culture. You've got to imagine what a shock it was for these disciples. Most days they were in shock therapy pruning. Because whether these disciples liked it or not, Jesus hung out with all the people you weren't meant to hang around with in Jewish culture. They watched Jesus touch lepers. They watched Jesus talk to Gentiles, welcome tax collectors, handle naked demon people in a cemetery. These were all the places that good Jewish boys did not go, to name a few. This was the intentional repositioning and pruning to get these disciples ready for a lifetime of service after Pentecost. You see, Jesus had to culturally detoxify these disciples so that they could become fruitful. <sighs> culturally detoxify. What do we need to be detoxified from? What needs to be cleaned off of us, from in us, to bring about greater fruitfulness? I can honestly say that I grew up pretty religious and probably pretty judgmental. I was in a, an isolated and protected church setting, so I didn't see too much of life. And God actually had to do a lot of pruning in me to be able to trust me, <laughs> to lead his people. I remember telling an elderly counsellor once, I just couldn't visit anyone who was living in adultery. And he just looked at me. He said, yes, you can. So I did. I just needed someone to challenge my uh, religious views, my judgments. So I did. And so the strongholds and the walls in my mind and in my heart were brought down. So that, and that had to happen. I had to be detoxified. I had to be pruned and cleaned before I could ever be fruitful for God. John 15 verse 3 says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remember, Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet. And when he did that, do you remember Peter's Reaction at first was, oh, no, you can't wash my feet. And then it was, oh, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and wash my head. Wash all of me. And Jesus said, you don't need, I don't need to wash all of you. You're already clean. I just need to wash your feet. Jesus was distinguishing between the big clean and the small clean. The big clean is our salvation experience where we become joined to Jesus and where all of our sin is washed away by the sacrifice of Jesus. We're then grafted on to the vine and we become part of God's family, the true vine. That's the big clean. But then there's the small clean. 
the regular daily cleaning and pruning. That's our ongoing sanctification. That's our training in righteousness, refining, purifying, bringing down wrong mindsets, uh, allowing the truth to guide us, growing us in our Christian life. Yes, we are connected to Jesus, the true vine, but we still need trimming off and pruning and cleaning for greater fruitfulness. John 15, 7 to 8 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory. What's to your Father's glory? That you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. God's word provides the daily, continuous cleaning we need to make us fruitful. And as we submit to that daily, continuous cleaning with God's word, if we're doing it on a daily basis, there'll be less need for a giant hack job later on. I know what I'd prefer. I think I just a little bit every day, God. Just a little bit every day, rather than a major amputation later on. Small adjustments. The pruning, cleaning lens is actually an incredibly freeing and healing lens to look through at past losses and discomforts and disappointments, heartbreaks, lost friends, redundancies, unexpected moves, poor investments, negative impact on other, of other people's decisions on us, personal or natural crisis, loss of position, loss of reputation. There are things that happen. We just don't know why. It doesn't necessarily mean, it didn't mean you were being punished. God was lifting, repositioning for greater fruitfulness, trimming, cleaning. Do you know, even the good branches get cut off. Even ones with big clumps of fruit will be cut off so that the main part of the vine can become more fruitful. So even good things seemingly that we've lost, we don't understand why. John 15, 2, every branch that does bear fruit, right? Every fruitful branch, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with that branch, God. It's got fruit on it. It looks nice. I want to keep that one. Even the fruitful things have to be trimmed. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, those losses, those repositions, those what the heck was that about deals that we go through. All things are worked together for the good of those who love him. Your heavenly father is never nearer than when he's pruning you. Your heavenly father is never nearer than when he's pruning you. He cuts away dead wood that might cause trouble, but often he cuts off living tissue (laughs) that's robbing you of your spiritual vigor. And it's those branches that are closest to the trunk the ones that come straight out of the trunk, those are the most fruitful branches. The ones that are closest to the true vine, they are the ones that will bear the most fruit. That's where the most productive abiding occurs. The closer we're positioned to Jesus, it's just going to happen. You know you won't have to try so hard. Things you have been slogging your guts out to try and make happen in your life, in your own strength, You just need to be close to Jesus, enjoying him, him enjoying you, having a good time, learning, loving, living. Stuff will just happen. So you're wondering about the Christmas tree. I wondered whether some of you could even concentrate on the rest of the message with a Christmas tree in the house. Some people did mention it wasn't Christmas early this morning. I said, I know. (laughs) Here's the question. Here's the question. What does the grapevine... Don't answer straight away. What does the grapevine have in common with the Christmas tree? Think. 
Just think. All right, next slide. Nothing. Absolutely nothing in common. They are both vitally different, but you know what happens? The grapevine is alive. Let's just look at the qualities. It is alive and it is growing, praise God. And it requires some repositioning and we will do some trellising. We will get this thing up so it doesn't go mouldy or get too damp. And it will produce fruit as we tend it. And that fruit will feed and will nourish others. Those are the qualities of the vine. Now, the Christmas tree. It's dead. It's dead and it will not grow any bigger. It doesn't need, prune. There's a, you know, it doesn't need pruning, so I don't have to actually work on that. But it also doesn't produce anything. It doesn't produce any fruit. And it's a bit bland looking by itself. Because it doesn't produce fruit, I've got to decorate it. I have to add some decorations to make the tree look nice. But this Christmas tree will feed no one. It is not productive. Here's the point. It is very easy to settle for the life as a a Christian Christmas tree that does not produce any fruit. But to disguise the fact that there's no fruit, we... um, Add some decorations. I'll just add a house. Look at that lovely house I bought. And uh, what else will I add? Any other things? And we'll, a car. See that sparkly new car? I must be so successful. <laughs> and that new, <coughs> whoops, that new job. There's the job. Everyone will be impressed. I've got a title and I've got a position. Very important person, VIP. I even have my own car park. And we just continue to add more things just so that people will think we're good and we're clever. Money. Oh, a holiday. Did a great holiday. And aren't you all impressed? It's still dead. It will never grow. It will never feed anybody. And it will never need pruning. The only repositioning will be shoving it up in the roof until next Christmas. <laughs> Jesus, the true vine, is the only one who will cause us to grow. We can tap into many other things, but they will not lead to fruitfulness and a life that goes on and that begins to feed others. We can be repositioned, we can be pruned, we can be cleaned for increased righteous, uh, increased fruitfulness. I'll just get the worship team to come up. And then we will reproduce the life of Christ in others as they eat of the fruit of our lives. And they too then become connected to the true vine. They'll taste the juice and it will be good. And they will tap into Jesus as the true vine. Now remember, which were the branches that are most fruitful on a vine? The ones closest to the original vine. The closer we come to Jesus. What a wonderful opportunity we are having in this series on knowing Jesus. And I think maybe at the beginning of it, you might have thought, oh yeah, I know him. Yeah. Oh, I know all the Bible stories. So good. Love Jesus. Maybe you thought you knew him. Can I say, there's so much more. There is so much more to know and to experience. And you'll know because you'll see the fruit starting to come, that you've gotten closer, closer into the vine. Have you been repositioned lately? Have you felt a bit pruned lately? Can I say, do not be discouraged. The repositioning and the pruning and the cleaning are a sign that you are connected. You are connected to the true vine. Jesus. And Father God is at work in you. It's a sign that you're being positioned for greater fruitfulness, that difficulty you're going through. And it is a sign that fruit is definitely coming. You're only repositioned, you're only pruned so that you can become more fruitful.